Hey guys, uh, Leo here. Um, good to connect with you guys after a couple weeks of not being able to connect with you guys. I have not been on vacation, but um, I have joined the millions of pastors globally that are just trying their best to pastor well and adjust to this new normal. I've been trying to test equipment, both microphones and cameras alike. I've been searching all sorts of conference call um, applications. I've been um, trying to think about creating content, what that looks like in creating content, and really just trying to figure out how do you do um, high... Uh, how do you do youth ministry um, in a time like this one? We had a lot of things scheduled on our calendar, um, whether it was kickball and questions, spring jam, dude day, Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, so many things scheduled. And now we have to adjust um in this new normal. And I think we have a way forward. After a lot of prayer, a lot of consideration, a lot of um, getting on the phone with youth pastors all over the country, really, I think we have a way forward. Now, before I reveal to you what youth ministry is going to look like um, in these next several weeks, um, I, I just have to say, man, th this coronavirus, this COVID-19 situation is just a phenomenal opportunity for intentional discipleship in the home, uh, namely family devotionals. It is an opportunity for parents to really do um, devotionals with their family, whether it's um, going through a series or even just um, reading scripture together. I mean, I think this is a phenomenal opportunity for that. I, I never want to outsource parenting, but I want to give parents resources to do um, their work well, because I am not the primary discipler in your students' lives. That's you. You are the primary discipler in their lives, and I just want to give you resources to do that job excellently so the next generation will know the goodness of God. So before I reveal to you what it's going to look like in these next couple of weeks, I just want to really quickly here give you five tips, okay, five tips in leading your family through devotionals, five tips in leading your family through devotionals. So most of them start with an R, the last one doesn't, and I'm, I'm sorry to Brent if he hears this. So tip number one, read it beforehand, okay? Read it beforehand. Whether you're going through a packaged curriculum devotional, whether you're going through videos, whether you're reading just scripture as a family, you as the leader, read it beforehand. <laughs> read it beforehand. God is not necessarily looking for some scholarly level Oxford Hebrew expertise, exegesis. I don't think he's necessarily looking for that, but he's looking for obedience, He's looking for obedience. And part of that obedience is in the preparation. A lot of people say, I'm just going to get out there. I'm going to wing it. Let the Holy Spirit do its job. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to wing it and let the Holy Spirit do its job. Well, yes, the Holy Spirit does work in those times, but he also works um, within the preparation. So tip number one is just very simple. Just read it beforehand. Let the text bear its full weight on you first before you teach it to anybody else. This was a part of the problems with the Pharisees. I mean, they, they would hear truth taught by Jesus and they would instantly start thinking, yeah, get him, Jesus, those sinners over there, those sinners over there. What's your heart like whenever truth is being taught, right? Are you like, hey, I, I need to take this in for myself? Or are you constantly thinking about your spouse or your kid or your cousin who needs to hear this more than you? No, no, no. Let the, let the text bear its full weight on you before you can teach it to anybody else. And, and just some practical ways that this helps is, by reading it beforehand, this helps you anticipate the question, the questions that people might have. It just helps you anticipate the questions and objections and even thoughts that people might have about what you're going through. And as a leader, it's important to know what people might pop up in their brains, even if they don't communicate it. And two, there's a certain type of fluidity that I have as a teacher um, whenever I've read the questions beforehand, whenever I know what questions come coming next, there's a type of fluidity I just have as I'm reading and, and I become less wooden and a lot more fluid and it just makes the conversation a lot more natural. So tip number one, as you lead your family through devotional is read it beforehand. Okay. Read it, whatever you're doing, read it, watch it, consider it beforehand. Number two, um, another simple one, but it's regularity. Okay. Regularity. Set a time and keep it. <laughs> Set a time as a family and keep it, okay? Spontaneous Bible studies tend to be really hit or miss. So as the leader, ask your family, hey, when does it work for all of us to get together um, and really meet and, and consider the things of God? 
Okay, set a time and actually keep it because what that does is regularity creates expectation. And what expectation does is it makes it easier for you to call students away from video game or call students away from Netflix or call students away from whatever. It makes it easier for that because if it's 654 and they know Bible studies at seven, they're going to start that game, that video game, knowing, hey, in six minutes, I got to be downstairs for Bible study. Like there's just an expectation there that makes it a little bit easier for you to call students away from what they're actually doing. So yeah, regularity creates expectation and actually makes it a little bit easier to call them out of that. Now, in my own Bible in a Year program, I'm going through the book of Numbers right now. And Numbers is, I think, 30 something chapters, 31 chapters, I believe. And it's really interesting. Um, in the first 10 chapters, you know, because it's documenting the story of Israel going from Mount Sinai to the promised land. Um, the first 10 chapters of this crazy adventure through the wilderness is just organization. The first 10 chapters is just God getting Israel ready for this road trip they're about to go on. Okay, he's saying, hey, you three tribes, you get over here. You three tribes, you get over here. Hey, the tribe of Levites, you guys sleep over here. You sleep on the north side. And, and whenever you carry the vessels of God, carry it in this sort of fabric. So what you see right there is that God is a God of order. God is a God of order. And as Christians, as little Christ, man, we should, we should mimic that and have some order to the way that we do um, Bible study in the home. So have some regularity about your devotional. So tip number one is read it beforehand. Tip number two is regularity. Tip number three, super important, is response. Okay? Response. Create a comfortable question and answer environment. Now, whenever I'm in groups of about 10 to 15 people or less, I tend to teach in a Socratic method. What that means is I'll tend to ask questions, just ask questions and ask questions and ask questions. During sermons, I just talk. But in groups of 10 to 15, I just ask questions and ask questions to get kids critically thinking about what the answer is. Now, why do I do that? Okay, why do I do that? Is it because I'm being patronizing? No. <laughs> is it because I just want them to feel more involved? Sure, but the real answer is this. I've been doing youth ministry now for a little under eight years, a little over, it's more or less eight years. And what I've noticed is students tend to remember what they say more than they ever remember what Leo says. Let me give you an example here. Um, grace is me giving you a gift that you don't deserve, while mercy is me withholding punishment that you deserve. So grace is me giving you a gift that you don't deserve, and mercy is me withholding punishment that you do deserve. Now, I say that and a kid might remember it. The ones that take notes are going to remember it probably. But the ones that don't, they're not going to remember that. So what I'll do is I'll go, hey, the Bible uses the word grace and mercy a lot. Are these words different? How has God shown us grace? Now, how has God shown us mercy? How are these words the same? Should we consider them in a different light? No, whenever you're able to walk students there by themselves, they tend to remember it a lot more. So create some space for discussions because um, in that space is a, lot, is a lot better than monologues. In that environment is a lot better than just a sermon or a monologue. So response is the third tip. The fourth tip is redemption. Okay, redemption. Bring it back to Jesus. <laughs> No matter what you're teaching about, man, find a way to bring it back to Jesus. Bring it back to the cross. We're not looking for um, behavioral modification. You know this already, but we're looking for spiritual transformation that only comes um, from, from Jesus and what he did as atoning uh, uh, work on the cross. So bring it back to Jesus. Uh, I love what Philippians 3, 1 says. Paul says, to write the same things to you are no trouble for me and is safe for you. <laughs> to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. But Paul's saying, listen, me being a broken record is no problem for me. And it's actually a good thing for you. And with that being said, man, we can, we can mimic that. Okay. Be a broken record about Jesus. Do not be afraid to be a broken record. He, the Bible repeats a lot of things a lot man, we can do the same. Be a broken record about Jesus' redemption. So whatever you're talking about, whether it's Exodus or 
cussing, whatever it is, man, be a broken record. Bring it back to Jesus. Okay, find a way to bring that back to Jesus. So those are four tips. So read it beforehand, have some regularity, have some response and redemption. And number five, okay, it is not separate than R, but it's the most important one is pray. Okay, pray like crazy. Okay, your junior higher or your high schooler, they're facing the biggest cultural moment of their adolescence. Okay, I don't like to over exaggerate things or over sensationalize things, but this is the most unique cultural moment of their adolescence. Like for me, it was 9 11. Like I remember being a second grader whenever 9 11 happened. And, and that day, I, I walked into school and dozens of people were huddled around one TV and teachers were crying. And the administrators actually um, evacuated us out of the school. I remember that really well. And that, I just saw the, 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 the ripple effects of that, how airports were never the same and, and flying was never the same. I, I remember that was the biggest cultural moment of my childhood, right? And now, um, I don't know what yours is. Maybe it's the OJ Simpson trial or a Kennedy dying. I don't know what yours is, but these students, as proms get canceled, as their favorite restaurants are closed, as toilet paper seem to go extinct, as graduations are getting canceled as we speak, as all major sports have shut down, this is the most unique cultural moment of their entire adolescence. But what it does, it creates an opportunity for Psalm 46 verse 10. Okay, Psalm 46 verse 10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Stillness, intentionally being still, not not boredom, okay, but intentionally being still is a lost art. As I've done um, youth ministry now for um, a little north of eight years, I've noticed that junior hires and high schoolers, oftentimes whenever they feel pain out there, they come home and they just crash, it's not actually Sabbath rest. They just come home and crash or they come home and numb their pain with Netflix or they um, medicate their pain with, with video games. But what this does right now, man, we have an opportunity for them to actually practice biblical stillness. So you as the primary discipler in their family, man, I, I would advise you right now, man, you pray for that. Okay, pray that they can be still. And not only pray for that, but take steps to actually cultivate that. Now, what if one of the main things, what if they can look back on this? Because they're never going to forget this moment. What if they look back at the coronavirus scare? And one of the things that they can think about is not necessarily the toilet paper extinction, but they can think about how high up you regard God's word. That would be, that's a huge testament in their life. Not that they can look back and then see how high or how much you consider God's word. Um, not out of um, a panic, but out of prudence. Not out of fear, but out of faith, right? This could be an Ebenezer in these students' lives to the sweetness and the awesomeness of God's word and pray for that. There's a lot of opportunity for that. You can only watch so much Netflix, so pray for that. So those right there are my five tips just for leading um, devotional time. So read it beforehand, have some regularity, um, have some response, um, redemption, and then obviously prayer. Um, so that's all I have for you guys right now. Again, next few days, I'm going to, I'm going to be telling you and revealing what, what youth ministry is going to be looking like in the future. But as of right now, I just wanted to leave you with those, with those five tips. I love you. I'm praying for you guys. I'm praying for you. And, um, yeah, God bless you.